All right, I see the Zoom room is filling up with participants. Welcome to Coffee Hour. We will be getting started in just a minute. As always, go ahead and let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from in the chat box. We have a great program for you today. I am joined by retired Air Force General Greg Tuhill, former Penn State Lion Ambassador, actually founding member of the Lion Ambassadors and over 25 year life member of the Penn State Alumni Association. And we're gonna talk about his over 30 years of service to our country in the military and then some of the great things he has done afterwards. Good to see you, Vince. Class of 82 down there in Charlottesville, Virginia. Welcome to Coffee Hour. We'll be getting started in just a moment. I see Mike Mazinko, class of 2003 from Madisonville, Pennsylvania. Mike, good, thank you for joining us. Good to have you. I see Paul McConaughey, class of 60, back here in State College. Paul, good to see you, as always. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Pete Sheridan from Blandon, good to see you, class of 98. See Ron from Southampton, class of 74. Where else would you rather, rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and welcome to the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Each week on Coffee Hour, you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they are passionate about, and you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State Network. We are recording this session, as always, and closed captions are available for this event. You can find the information in the chat uh, in Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. I hope you have your coffee. I know some people had a late night last night, but we have a great show for you today. We are going to be talking with General Greg Tuhill from the class of 83. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Retired Brigadier General Greg Tuhill is one of the nation's premier IT and cyber leaders, named by President Obama as the first Federal Chief Information Security Officer of the United States government. Greg now serves as president of AppGate Federal, a cybersecurity and advanced technology company. He also serves on the faculty of Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College and is a member of the ISACA Board of Directors. He's a 25 year life member of the Penn State Alumni Association and a 30 year one month and three days, I believe, veteran of our United States Air Force. Please welcome into the program, General Greg Tuhill. General Tuhill, how are you today? I'm doing great, Paul. Thanks for having me. Hope you're doing uh, well. I am doing well. I am doing well. It was a little bit of a late night. I got my coffee and uh, I'm just so excited about our conversation. So let's start right at the beginning. How did you become a Penn Stater? Well, you know, growing up in the uh, Pittsburgh area, uh, I, I was always exposed to Penn State. And 
uh, the two hills came into Pennsylvania in the late 1830s. Uh, you know, they did a pit stop in Canada be, uh, on their way from Ireland, but they got here as fast as they could. And, uh, you know, frankly, I'm the same way. I got to Penn State as fast as I could. I, I looked at a lot of other colleges and universities, um, but they don't call it Happy Valley for nothing. So uh, I, I got to Penn State as fast as I could. Absolutely. And while you were at Penn State, you were involved in a number of things. You were a USG senator. I mentioned a founding member of our Lion Ambassador Program, uh, an officer in the Arnold Society, which is the honor society of our Air Force ROTC. Talk about some of the activities you were involved in as a student. Well, you know, in addition to those three, you know, like, like a lot of other folks, I I played all the intramural sports that I could. I enjoyed uh, doing that. Uh, I, I was involved in all sorts of different things. Uh, I lived in East Halls all four years too, uh, which wow. you know, back, back then was unusual, but I, I like to walk. Uh, but I also, you know, I played the club lacrosse and some other things out there. Uh, you know, as a student, uh, you know, like the, like the alma mater says, you know, I arrived from childhood's gate, mobilis in the hands of fate, and I didn't, like a lot of students, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew, uh, when I was, you know, growing up. Uh, but Penn State helped me grow up and um, I, I experienced a whole swath of different things at Penn State that helped me make, uh, become the person that I am today. So uh, I, I want to dive in a little bit on being a founding member of the Lion Ambassadors. And I mean, certainly when you were a Lion Ambassador, you knew it was a new group on campus. Uh, could you have imagined uh, what it has grown into today? Now, to, to be perfectly honest, no. We, we uh, the, the few 50 that were uh, uh, plucked from the student body, um, we, we actually were a different organization than what the Lion Ambassadors has evolved to today. You know, we were, yes, the student alumni uh, core, but we actually got out, uh, we, we went out to different alumni association chapters. We went and uh, when we'd go home uh, on breaks, uh, we would uh, speak about Penn State, share with prospective students our experiences. Um, and, and yeah, we did do some tours, but we didn't do the walking backwards type tours that I think a lot of the line ambassadors right. now are doing. Uh, it, it was a different organization, but it had great potential. And I've been delighted to see the line ambassadors grow like they have. And um, my daughter uh, uh, attended Penn State and also was a line ambassador. Uh, I don't know if there's any other uh, line ambassadors that have been generational, but I'll lay claim right. that the, the Two Hills were the first uh, multi-generational uh, <laughs> line ambassadors. There have there have actually been several. Um, the Murphys come to mind. Um, Kevin yeah. and Kim, I Kevin and Kim Murphy. Oh yeah, Kevin Murphy's two sons, um, Quill and Carver, were both line ambassadors, and I'm sure that's just uh, one of a number of examples. I know that there's a. Uh, line ambassadors that run through a lot of different families from siblings who were mm -hmm. uh, ambassadors with each other. Uh, but you are among the few that have ge uh, generational line ambassador heritage, if you will. Uh, so you graduate from Penn State with a political science and an engineering degree. Um, and then you head to the West Coast for a master's program at USC while beginning your Air Force service. How did all that come about? Well, you know, just to be clear, I. Uh... Uh, you know, as I, as I graduated from Penn State, one of the things that you do when you've been commissioned as an officer, and I, I had an ROTC scholarship uh, uh, in engineering, but I really thought I was going to be a, a lawyer. You know, I figured technology plus law would be very powerful in the business world. Um, and the Air Force sent me down to Mississippi uh, for almost a year of extensive electronics and communications and computer and satellite training. Um, so I, I had a very technical track in the Air Force. And, you know, joining the Air Force as an officer who wears glasses, I couldn't be a pilot. Uh, and that, that just turned out to be uh, fine for me uh, because I had some really exciting adventures. And that very first assignment after I graduated from tech uh, school, 
Uh, I actually was stationed up in the Tacoma, Washington area, up in the Pacific mm -hmm. Northwest, uh, in an air defense unit with, I was one of the few non-pilot, non-operation uh, officers. And I immediately enrolled in a master's program at Southern Cal. And um, back in the early 80s, you know, what was going on in the Pacific Northwest? Well, we had this new company called Microsoft that was uh, uh, just starting out there. Right. Um, and Southern Cal actually had a, a campus up in the Pacific Northwest. And my classmates, um, and I went to night school basically, while I was still serving on active duty. And I got a degree in uh, systems management with a certification in what was then called uh, information systems management, you know, learning how to build and manage uh, computer systems. And that's what I was doing on active duty during my day job. And uh, ended up going down to, uh, to campus in California but it really solidified in my mind's eye that where I wanted to go was uh, along the technical track and uh, computers, computer systems, uh, electronics, all of that was really punctuating not only national security, but national prosperity. And, you know, military was really on the front end of that. And I was very fortunate to be involved in that early wave of not only communications and electronics and computer systems, but the internet as well. And so talk a little bit about your, I, again, I mentioned it, and I love the precision of the military, 30 years, one month and three days of service to our country. Talk a little bit about um, your, your promotion and kind of rise in the ranks of the Air Force and how that paralleled your interest in te the technology space. Well, uh, you know, frankly, one of the great things about uh, serving our country in the military is, is there's always uh, opportunities for advancement, excitement, you know, the meaningful work. And one thing that we said in the military is, is it's not about making money. It's about making a difference. A difference not only for your country, but your, the people you work with. And I was uh, very fortunate during my military career. Um, and... and they do read at your retirement ceremony how long you served. Uh, and I was kind of shocked to find that it was 30 years, one month and three days because it flew by rather quickly. But it comes with sacrifice. And um, I had 23 different uh, jobs uh, during those 30 years, uh, many moves. Uh, my my uh, children are extremely adept at geography and uh, have got a lot of been there, done that t-shirts along the way. Uh, but I've been very fortunate that I, uh, I was selected to command two different squadrons, one in Europe and then one in uh, California, uh, a, a communications group, which is the next echelon higher with multiple squadrons uh, out in Illinois. And then I uh, was also very fortunate to serve as the commander of a wing. Uh, we're uh, at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. I was command, uh, commander of a wing of 12,000 airmen and uh, running all of the technical training for the United States Air Force's uh, cyber and communications and electronics, 32 different career fields. And we basically ran a, uh, an accredited college uh, where we would literally teach college level courses to our airmen uh, in advanced technologies. Uh, that was way cool. And the Air Force kept on giving me opportunities and new jobs. And um, after I left Wing Command, for example, I moved uh, to Kuwait for two years and I served as the defense attache as a general and as well as the senior defense official in Kuwait during a really pivotal time uh, when the president uh, wanted to pivot uh, the majority of our forces out of uh, Iraq and they came through Kuwait. And they sent me out there to negotiate a new bilateral defense agreement with the Kuwaitis and uh, mission accomplished. It was a great experience. And my daughter ended up graduating from high school in Kuwait. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, it's a, what an, an amazing experience for your, for your family and, and some, some great experience that you gained along the way. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by 
retired Air Force General and President of Appgate Federal, Greg Tuhill. Uh, General Tuhill, so throughout your time in the service, uh, you began to build the reputation and expertise um, in technology, security, data, and what we now know today as, as cybersecurity. Uh, you are a pioneer in, in this space. I think we're all kind of familiar with what, maybe because of TV and movie, right? What a military mission might look like, right? Take mm -hmm. this hill, right? Um, secure this bridge. Uh, but what does it look like uh, in, in the technology uh, and data space? What does a, a mission look like um, from a military perspective in that world? Well, you know, there's a couple of things. First of all, cyberspace is a, dem uh, a contested domain, just like airspace, uh, ground and sea. And I would contend that we're clearly seeing a lot of evidence of just how contested that environment is with disinformation and misinformation campaigns. We are seeing criminal groups uh, launching ransomware and the like. But as you take a look at from an operational standpoint, uh, the United States military has been operating in cyberspace for, for decades. And if we're going to run a cyber operations, there's actually a lot of parallels with some of the things you've probably seen with like movies like 12 o'clock high, where, you know, you go out there and you take a look at uh, understanding the environment. It's kind of like a weather report. You know, you right. understand what the, the, the environment looks like. You want, you, you get your intelligence to find um, uh, your targets. You look for things that are the equivalent of air defenses uh, in cyberspace with different types of countermeasures and controls that could be used against uh, you trying to achieve your target and your objectives. And on the same token, if you're defending, and uh, I'm one of those guys who believes that there is no such thing as an offensive infantryman or a defensive infantryman, it's just an infantryman. Same thing applies really from a cyber perspective. You need to know how to defend as well as how to um, leverage the tools to meet your objective. But we're certainly seeing that with America's uh, economy uh, highly reliant on information technology, as our intellectual property continues to be attacked and stolen by nation state actors and criminal groups, the, the ability to uh, maintain a, a solid and trusted infrastructure and ecosystem leveraging information technology in the cyberspace domain is critically important for national security and national prosperity. And uh, during my time in the military, we did an awful lot of uh, great things uh, to protect that national security. And then during my time at DHS and later in the White House, uh, we wanted to leverage those uh, great experiences from the military to raise the game for everybody to pr better protect the country. What are some examples of attacks that you encountered? I think we think of, um, and, and I think our, our thinking around this has changed, right? With the emergence of, um, of terrorist groups, right? It's not one country against another necessarily, but it might be a country being attacked by a group that resides in another country or a group that resides all around the world, right? And their connection is um, through online mechanisms. But what are some examples of attacks that you encountered? And what, what are some of the things that we should be, I don't, I don't wanna say worried about, but um, what might be one that would surprise uh, where it would come from? Well, um, let me unpack those, that series of sure. questions for you. <laughs> right. uh, so the, the, the attacks that I've seen uh, during my career over the last 40 some years, uh, we've seen uh, some significant shifting in the attack uh, vectors. Uh, early in my career in the early 80s, we, we basically saw a lot of uh, activity where it would be nation state on nation state. And that's because not everybody had computers and you know, it cost a lot of money back then to really uh, get the computer capabilities that could affect attacks. But then you had a, a group, and, and, and let me back up. There's a really good book called The Cuckoo's Egg by S Cliff Stoll, uh, S-T-O-L-L. And back in 86, that's really where we started seeing nation state on nation state attacks using uh, computer systems. 
Um, since that time, we've seen attacks like Solar Sunrise, the Chinese hacking into uh, personnel databases back in the 2006 timeframe, Shell Shock, which was a uh, exploitation of Unix shells. Um, we've seen uh, OPM breach uh, during the uh, time I was at DHS. Uh, my team, we led the incident response for the Chinese hack of the Office of Personnel Management. We're seeing a lot of folks doing the nation state on nation state, but we're also seeing, and particularly since 1999-ish, uh, we're seeing nation state actors and criminal groups going after intellectual property uh, to try to gain a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Uh, Chinese have been especially adept in um, the, the theft of intellectual property in order to get a leg up in the market. We're seeing the Russians who are extremely capable. Uh, they're trying to offset the fact that they don't necessarily have the military strength that they used to, but they still wanna have a presence on the world stage. So they're leveraging cyber operations to maintain that presence and knowledge and in intelligence capabilities on a world stage. And I contend that they're the masters of disinformation right now and have been attacking the integrity of our election systems through disinformation and misinformation. And, and then in regards to the question on, you know, what does everybody need to be paying attention to? Well, the cost to a, be an attacker has gone down to basically less than a hundred bucks now. Um, I can go and if I have bad intent, I can go out and buy a Kindle, for example, off of Amazon for less than a hundred bucks. I can go to YouTube uh, and get training videos on how to hack into different things. So I can go on uh, the internet and get all the tutorials on how to leverage certain tools for hacking and become wow. a hacker if I'm unsavory and unscrutable. So the cost for the attacker has gone down and the difficulty for the defenders has gone up as the more and more things are connected to the internet. And I think right now from around the world, but particularly here in the United States, our risk exposure has grown as we continue to connect things to the internet. And a great example, and we saw it in uh, the Ukraine in an incident that my team and I responded to um, where Russian hackers turned off the lights in the Ukraine in December of uh, 2015 for a while is we're connecting more and more things to you know, the internet, like industrial control systems, operational technology, internet of things. And many people don't even realize that stuff is connected, but it's easy for us in the cyber operations business to scan, find it, and if I can see it, I can kill it. So yeah. we gotta be very careful of that. We also need to be very jealous about our privacy because right now we have what uh, many people are calling a surveillance capital uh, capitalism uh, growing, where people are harvesting our personal information, packaging it, and then reselling it as a commodity. And I think uh, we are missing out on a very uh, open and transparent discussion here in the United States on privacy, because right now, uh, I believe privacy is threatened by some of the developments we're seeing in the marketplace. Yeah, it's actually, uh, and I don't want to go down this route, but I'll just make a comment that it's actually interesting um, that privacy wasn't a bigger issue in this uh, presidential cycle because I think some other things kind of took precedent, precedent uh, with the, the coronavirus, right, which we wouldn't have ex expected. But I, um, you know, privacy is going to be probably the biggest issue that we face, um, you know, from a um, from uh, future Supreme Court decisions to uh, a lot of things that we're facing as a country. And, and um, I wish it got more attention than it than it actually did during during this cycle. I, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, we as citizens, that's something that we need to uh, make sure that our elected representatives uh, put on the agenda. And just because it wasn't on uh, the agenda for some of the candidates during this election doesn't mean that we as citizens uh, don't don't share with our elected representatives uh, the importance of this topic. 
Absolutely. So um, our paths crossed in 2016. You were uh, appointed by President Barack Obama as our country's first chief information security office, a position that is part of almost every C-suite uh, in, in corporate America. Um, what does the government equivalent of that position look like? Well, you know, uh, in the government, if you think the government uh, as a business, you know, we we were running a, at that time uh, a four trillion dollar a year annual operating budget. We had uh, over two hundred uh, individually owned and operated uh, departments, agencies, uh, boards, bureaus, and you know, uh, subsidiaries. And you know, my role as the uh, federal chief information security officer was created in the aftermath of the OPM breach. The, the Chinese hackers got into the Office of Personnel Management and uh, exfiltrated some very sensitive, unclassified, uh, unclassified material. And it was very obvious, uh, even before that breach, that within uh, the dot gov domain that we weren't necessarily practicing what we were preaching. Uh, we needed right. to have some good order and discipline uh, regarding how we were operating and maintaining our computer systems, how we were protecting information. And as my military career uh, was uh, nearing its end, um, I was actually recruited to continue my service and uh, retired Vice Admiral Mike McConnell who had previously served as the director of national intelligence, um, he, he asked me to continue my service and made the phone call. And next thing I knew, I was deputy assistant secretary of Homeland Security and concurrently serving as the director of the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. Uh, I didn't make up that acronym. I just had to live with it. Affectionately, uh, affectionately known as MKIC, right? MKIC, yeah. Um, so, you know, but when they elevated, when the president elevated me to be the chief information security officer, uh, I was doing several things. First of all, is uh, establishing policy uh, and a strategy. You know, strategy is critically important because you know, one thing every uh, military person understands is that when you got a, a mob, the, the, the best way to get a mob from point A to point B is you get them organized and then you count cadence and march them over to where you need to be. Right. So that's what we were trying to do in putting together the, uh, a coherent strategy that would apply to the entire federal government, which, which we did. Um, but I also, uh, you know, I served as a leader of the, of the community and we had uh, literally over 100,000 different IT and cybersecurity professionals in the .gov domain supported by hundreds of thousands of contractors. So I was the functional uh, leader of that community of interest uh, within the federal government. And, and then further, you know, the coach and mentor, uh, making sure that we're trying to develop that next generation of leaders. And one of the things I learned throughout my military career is the job that I was gonna have 10 years from uh, today hadn't been invented yet, and I was gonna have to invent it. Uh, so I had to help shape uh, the workforce. And you know that's one of the things that I continue to do uh, today in my current roles is uh, try to make that next generation better. So I wanna digress for just a second. In 2016, you were kind enough to invite us down um, to NKIC. Uh, and I got to tell you, it was um, for those who have um, who don't have an, an understanding of what NKIC is, it would be everything you would imagine seeing on TV as kind of the, the nerve center of cybersecurity in, in our country. Right. They, they came in, they did. You had to send your name and Social Security number beforehand. They did background checks. You had to show your ID. Um, they kept your ID, they kept your cell phone. You could go into this room, but you couldn't have anything. You couldn't have a bag or anything. You go in one door, you have to wait for the door behind you to close before you go into the next door. And then it's this wall of uh, screens monitoring activity going on all around the world, right? It was, it was cyber activity all around the world with people at their desks um, on, their, on their computers. It was something out of... Uh, that you would that you would see on that you would see on a movie, 
it, it was uh, it was impressive. It was exciting, uh, and and we we appreciate that invitation down there. But we came back and uh, told the story to other Penn Staters, and that led to a feature in the Penn Stater magazine. Uh, talk a little bit about what it was like to be featured by your alma mater's alumni magazine. Well, you know, frankly, not, it was not just me. It was uh, several other of my colleagues who right. uh, are, are, you know, passionate Nittany Lions that were part of that NKIC team. But we were all delighted. We were thrilled because, you know, it's important when you are in public service to demonstrate to the public, hey, you know, we think you're getting a good return by the, the fruits of our labor. And it gave us the opportunity uh, through the Penn Stater and, uh, you know, th thanks to you and the Alumni Association and Tina Hay and, uh, okay. you know, uh, the folks there to help pass on uh, part of our message too, that the nation is under attack uh, via cyber means. And it's not just the federal government assets, because one of the things that we were doing in the end kick was is working with the private sector as well through public uh, private sector partnerships to raise awareness that hey this is a risk management issue this we've got great risk exposure as most businesses nearly every business out there it's got significant risk exposure in the cyber domain so you know it, it's always nice to have your alma mater say some nice things about uh, you and the, the product of a, a great Penn State education, but it also was uh, really great that uh, Penn Stater uh, magazine was able to help us amplify our message uh, for the public that, hey, we need to be paying attention to cybersecurity for both national security as well as national prosperity. So thank you for that. You know, it was... absolutely. It was it was a great story. It was well well received. Um, yeah, my mom and, just... and dad loved it too. <laughs> so um, one thing I'm struck by, uh, Greg, is, and and you again just personified it um, just a moment ago when you talked about your role as the chief information security officer, and the last piece you added on to the end was coach and mentor. Um, I'm struck by kind of your commitment to education, right? You've served on um, an adjunct post at Washington University in St. Louis, at Georgetown, and now on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon. Why has teaching been important to you throughout your career? Well, you know, frankly, I hadn't even contemplated it uh, as, as a student. You know, that was not on my game plan. But as I went into the Air Force, uh, it, it's part of the culture of the military that you, in fact, become an instructor um, as part of your career. And, uh, you know, we hear about it, you know, if you're in the aviation track, you cannot advance unless you have qualified as an instructor pilot. And uh, in my career field, same type of thing. You are continually training uh, so that you can be more effective in your roles. And, you know, it's an American military tradition that it's the next next person up. So if one person falls, the next one comes up. And you can't do that if you're not training that person to be available to step up. And that, that culture kind of has imprinted me. And uh, it's something that I, I've embraced. And it's helped me in my uh, duties and in my advancement throughout my career is to make sure that I surround myself with people who are smarter than me. And not only am I sharing my uh, experiences with them to make them better, but also through learning from them, I can make myself better as a leader and uh, you know, hopefully achieve our goals as a team. And you know, uh, I enjoy it too. I, I find that uh, as I share my experiences and they, uh, my, my students share their experiences, uh, I think we're all better as a result. You've also taken kind of your commitment to, to teaching the next step. Uh, and you've been part of uh, either authoring or, or writing uh, several books on the topic. Now, um, as important as a topic as cybersecurity is, I would imagine it's daunting writing a book about something that may be obsolete the moment it hits the bookshelves, right? I mean, 
the the world as you've described it is changing so fast. Uh, but what was it like to put together a book knowing um, knowing that what you're writing uh, may change by the time it gets by the time it gets published? <laughs> well, well, thanks. You know, first of all, uh, I don't write on things that are going to change right away. Okay. Um, there, there are some things and, and you know, I, I've got two books um, that, that are on Amazon. Uh, the first is uh, one that I co-authored with my dad um, called Commercialization of Innovative Technologies, Bringing Good Ideas to the Marketplace. And we actually collaborated uh, over the internet on that while I was deployed for 13 months to the Middle East. I had a, a combat tour and um, I devoted uh, 30 minutes uh, every other evening to just sitting down, you know, after 11.30 p.m., uh, you know, I, I try to get to bed around midnight and then get up at four o'clock and start the clock all over. But I would always invest maybe three times a week, um, about 30 minutes to, to read the, the emails my dad had sent as we were collaborating on this book and then to craft up my thoughts. And over the course of 13 months, we were able to put together a pretty credible book. And, and it's weathered with time because it's uh, foundational, it's a framework for looking at how you take good technical ideas and bring them to the marketplace. And when I wrote Cybersecurity for Executives, a practical guide, I, I was talking for the, you know, to the audience that were executives, who are board of directors members, officers of companies, and how to take that highly complex technical aspects of cybersecurity but really to translate that into business, uh, into a business framework. And that's weathered actually uh, very, very well. And is, uh, that, that book's being used by multiple universities now. Uh, and uh, even though it's been six years since it's published uh, and now Wiley's asking me for another edition, it, it's weathered well because I didn't focus on the actual technology you know, here's a Unix box with this particular right, operating right. system. I, I, func I focused on the function and the business return. And I think, you know, from an executive standpoint, um, you want to see how you get the best return on investment and how to make those decisions on where to invest. And, and that's really how I've uh, focused on the, the writing of the books. But I do do commentary uh, weekly on the actual technology, but I usually do that through uh, print media, magazines, uh, television interviews, that kind of stuff. You know, I didn't plan on asking you about this, but I did notice that, that the two books you wrote um, were with somebody who shared a last name with you, and I assumed it was a, a family project, but what was it like to, to do that project with your father and kind of share, uh, share that with him? Well, you know, the first one, uh, he was the lead author. Uh, and, and think of it as kind of like me as the apprentice. Um, but for the second one, uh, that was my book. But I asked uh, my father to, to assist me. Um, and, uh, you know, he was a great editor. Uh, we made it through uh, the, the actual uh, true editing phase with Wiley with uh, only uh, three corrections. Uh, right. for a 400 page book, that's pretty dang good. Uh, so I, I give him credit for that. Um, but yeah, my father uh, is uh, first in our family to get a college degree, uh, ended up getting a, a PhD. Uh, I was born while he was at uh, MIT, uh, so he's an engineer. And uh, we collaborated extremely well in both of our projects, but it was very clear who was in charge for each one. <laughs> That is great. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by 25-year life member of the Penn State Alumni Association, retired Air Force General, and now president of Appgate Federal, Greg Tuhill. Greg, talk a little bit about Appgate uh, Federal and, and the work that your company does. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Appgate Federal is a cybersecurity and advanced technology company. Um, we specialize in some really high-end tools that are extremely easy to use and, and help organizations uh, implement the zero trust security strategy, retire their VPNs, the 
virtual private networks are 24 years old. They first arrived when Derek Jeter was a rookie and the Palm Pilot came out. <laughs> and, and frankly, hackers have gotten plenty of time to figure out how to defeat your VPNs. Uh, so we've got some uh, awesome technology uh, that uh, uh, is really displacing VPNs in the marketplace. We also have a bunch of former government uh, trained cyber operators that help organizations and businesses better defend uh, their information, their intellectual property and their livelihoods. Uh, uh, we've been very successful, we're growing and uh, uh, the future as the Air Force would say, uh, the horizon's pretty bright. All right, we like to have a little bit of fun here on coffee hour. So I'm gonna go to what we call our lightning round here, ask you a few quick hitter questions. Uh, but the first one is, what's your favorite Penn State memory? Well, there's so many, um, uh, but you know, as I was reflecting on that, I think um, one of the coolest things that we had while I was a student there was when Frank Abergnale came as part of the uh, lecture series in Eisenhower Auditorium. Um, he was the guy that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio uh, played or portrayed in Catch Me As You Can. Okay. And uh, Frank Abagnale came in and talked uh, to us for about, it was, shoot, I think it was about two hours there in Eisenhower about how he went from high school kid to world-class con man and then, you know, got caught, was imprisoned, and now, you know, at that time he converted to a security consultant. Um, Frankly, that kind of lecture really helped me in my professional career uh, as a cyber operator uh, because I, I got to meet a con man, one of the world-class ones. And as we were going toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, nation state actors trying to hack into us and criminal groups, uh, you know, meeting Frank Abagnale was pretty cool. How about your favorite class at Penn State? That one's a tough one because there were so many. Um, I really enjoyed um, some of my mathematics and science classes, some I didn't, but uh, <laughs> the one that I think was really cool was uh, Comparative Religions with Dr. Charles Prevish. Um, you know, some folks would go out and take uh, uh, an elective and, you know, uh, just try to go get uh, something that was, you know, get them an A or something like that. Uh, I took comparative religions with uh, Dr. Prebish because frankly, I, I was pretty interested and I heard great things about his course and it was great. Um, and, and frankly, it came back years and years later to help me as I served in the Middle East and having a understanding of how religion influences society perspectives um, and, and things of that sort was critically important to me as a, a, a senior leader in the military. You know, a lot of folks would say, well, hey, you know, everybody in the military is Captain Kirk. And I'd say, no, you know, our, our generals and admirals strive to be Captain Picard, not, not necessarily Kirk. Kirk when you need yeah. to be, but Picard. And I, I thought uh, the comparative religions course with uh, Dr. Prebish was, really provocative and helped helped me uh, in my dealings with people uh, throughout my career and even to today. You know, I, I, I don't want to go too far down this, but uh, because I want to get to some of these other questions, yeah. but I have been struck throughout my career in having the opportunity to meet um, commanders and generals and admirals um, from across our military. And the, the thing that I'm continually surprised by and should stop being surprised by because it's been so consistent is um, how adept those people have all been at their soft skills, right? You think, um, you, you sometimes think military, right? And you think kind of rough and tumble and, and kind of uh, no nonsense, kind of head down kind of leaders, right? And, and that's just, not, that hasn't been my experience. My experience with the, the generals that, um, and the admirals that I have been able to meet I've always been struck by their, uh, by their, uh, you know, their ability to um, uh, to empathize uh, by by their soft skills. It's just been um, really impressive that the level that they care for um, the people that they are in charge of, uh, and that they care for kind of the work that they've been trusted to do. 
Well, th thank you for that. And I don't think it's just the admirals and the generals, Paul. You know, frankly, when you take a look at the uh, non-commissioned officer creed in the Air Force, for example, the, the charge for the non-commissioned officer is empathy, not apathy. That's one of the, the major charges. And, um, you know, if, if you're going to count on your buddy to protect you in battle, you got to protect them as well, 24 by 7. And um, we, we, I've been very fortunate uh, throughout my, my whole life uh, to be a member of some really great teams. And, you know, the, the Penn State community uh, has uh, helped uh, shape my, my life. But, you know, that, those same values my parents had, I, Penn State imprinted, so did the Air Force. And, you know, we're all in this together. We, we, you know, Absolutely. at the end of the day, when they, uh, when they plant me in uh, Arlington, um, uh, I'll, I'll be judged by how I treat others and so will others, you know? Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, military does a pretty good job of reinforcing that for us. How about your favorite spot on campus? Oh, yeah, I think one of the coolest places that I would go and uh, one of the fonder memories was back when I was a freshman going up to Herman G. Fisher Plaza uh, and dragging my room key along the Fisher Plaza sign. And yeah, I, it, it sure sounded like the Fisher Price toy, you know, that you pull behind you <laughs> as, as a kid. Right. Uh, and I remember doing that one night in 79. It was a snowy night. The, I'd just come out of uh, Petit Library uh, upon closure. You know, it was late night. And there was nobody out there. The, the loop wasn't running. The snow had come down. There was a couple inches. And I just remember dragging my key uh, as I was walking back to East Halls and going to make the dreaded walk across uh, parking lot 80. But the, the, the click, click, click of the, the key on Fisher Plaza, that was pretty cool. Yeah. How about your most unusual we are moment, right? Kind of the un, um, unusual or unexpected place where you heard we are. Um, it was, you know, there's been plenty on them uh, all around the world. I've, I've only been in 45 countries and, and counting. Um, still want to add some more. But um, I, I, I remember being in uh, Iraq uh, supporting combat operations. I was the director of Allied Air Forces uh, C4 systems, command, control, communications, and computer systems. So, uh, you know, doing it for all the Allied Air Forces. And we were working a special project up in Iraq uh, where they tasked me and my team to figure out how to keep all of the, the convoys on the ground in constant communications because we were seeing a rise in uh, improvised explosive devices and they were being attacked, but they were only given handheld radios, which were line of sight. And Iraq, the terrains looked hilly. So I was up there working that project with my team. And uh, I, I remember uh, you know, walking on one of the, uh, the forward operating bases, and I saw some Pen Pennsylvania guardsmen uh, from the Army. And uh, one thing about the Army is, is they put their, you know, they put their unit patch on their sleeve. And the Pennsylvanians, it's a keystone. You know, so, you know, typically, and I was a colonel at the time, they'd see the eagles, and the soldiers would come up and, you know, pop me a salute and I'd salute back. Um, and, you know, sometimes the soldiers, if they're, they've got parachute wings, they'll yell out airborne and you, you reply with all the way. But as I saw these Pennsylvanians come up, uh, they popped me the salute and I saluted back and I yelled out to them, we are, and they yelled back Penn State. And <laughs> it, it, you know, it was awesome, you know, particularly for my troops. And we were walking, we were walking to the chow hall and, uh, or pardon me, they call it now the dining facility. facility. <laughs> but we, go, we all called it the chow hall. But, you know, really proud of, you know, my Penn State background. And uh, many, many times I'd see the, the Pennsylvania Guardsmen deployed forward. And uh, we'd give the shouts of we are. And, That's uh, great. 
Yeah, and actually I was out there for, like I said, for that particular tour, 13 months and uh, did not get home for Christmas. Uh, so my troops actually gave me as a Christmas gift, an animatronic Nittany lion. You know, you, pre you squeeze his hand and it was, uh, you know, the, the Nittany lion uh, and it would play the fight song. Uh, so that That's was really saying. cool. And I had actually ordered uh, a bunch of Nittany lion hats and I handed out to my team. I uh, had a, a staff of about 30 uh, and I handed out Nittany lion caps. So around the compound, they, they wore their Nittany lion caps a lot. And that was, that was pretty cool too. That's amazing. How about your favorite Penn State sport? Lacrosse. Um, I actually lacrosse. took uh, a lacrosse class and um, ended up playing uh, uh, with, with the club uh, at the time and uh, actually got a three minute line against uh, Maryland, uh, which was memorable because I got hit so dang hard. The guy from Maryland <laughs> bent my stick and I sported that bruise for about uh, three months on, the, uh, on my shoulder. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it, it was great. Um, and, and frankly, I wasn't, I wasn't good enough to make the team. I sat on the, so far on the bench, I think I was in Belfont, uh, but uh, <laughs> it, it was fun. I got an A in the course though. That's awesome. That's great. How about your favorite flavor of creamery ice cream? Mint chip, the mint chocolate chip. You can't, right. you can't touch that anywhere in the world. Penn State's creamery is the best. Excellent. Hey, we have a couple questions coming in from our audience. First, uh, Mike Mazinko, Iraq, 2005, 2006, the 28th ID Iron Soldiers. He just gives a big we are back to you. And um, from Penn Frank State. McLaughlin. Frank wants to know, it seems like you love your work. What do you do outside of work for fun and to maintain work-life balance? Yeah. Thanks, Frank. You know, uh, frankly, I think that um, you, you got to have passion for what you do. And, um, you know, when I was in at Ingemar Middle School uh, in Ingemar, Pennsylvania, uh, I read a, a poem by uh, a poet named Ogden Nash. And it basically said something that if work is play, then you never have to work. And, um, you know, I've tried to look for things that I'm, uh, I'm passionate about. And, you know, for, for when I'm at work, I, I'm doing something that matters, makes a difference. And that brings me great joy. And things that I do when I'm off duty, um, uh, I, I continue to write. I got two other books that are in the works, but you know, frankly, building a business as part of a startup uh, has taken a little bit of time from that. But um, I, I, I like to write, I like to teach, um, and uh, my wife and I, uh, we prior to COVID, we like to travel a lot and uh, see the world. And uh, I've been very blessed that a lot of uh, organizations have asked me to come in and talk about cybersecurity, best practices, risk management. Um, and, and uh, for example, over the last three years, I've been able to uh, keynote uh, presentations in places like uh, Australia, uh, where I keynoted the Australian Information Security Association meetings in Melbourne. And then my wife and I went and uh, snorkeled. I took some time off and we snorkeled uh, in the Great Barrier Reef. That was way cool. Um, last year for September 11th, I was uh, keynoting um, the Oceana Cyber Conference in uh, Wellington, or pardon me, not Wellington, Auckland, uh, New Zealand. Uh, and I took a day and uh, went and saw the Lord of the Rings uh, uh, right. Hobbit Town. That was cool. Uh, and then uh, last year during the Dios de Muerte, I was in Mexico City keynoting the Mexican Cyber Conference uh, in Mexico City. So. Um, my wife and I, we like to travel and see the world, and uh, we, we've had great fun. And after 34 plus years, um, uh, she's almost got me paid off. <laughs> Wonderful. Paul McConaughey points out that he lived in Ingemar for 16 years, and both of his kids went to Ingemar Middle School. So a uh, small world there as well. Greg, that's all the time that we have today. 
your life has certainly swelled thy fame of dear old state. And for that, we're truly grateful. Thanks for sharing your story on Coffee Hour. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, Paul, we are. Penn State. If you are a member of the Penn State Alumni Association, thank you for your support. If not, you can go to our website at alumni.psu.edu and become a member of the world's largest alumni association. We will be back uh, tomorrow night, tomorrow night, Thursday night, eight o'clock uh, with another edition of Football Letter Live uh, with John Black. Uh, another great uh, edition of Football Letter Live coming eight o'clock tomorrow night. Thanks again for all you do for the glory, for the university and for the future. We are.